Hello, and welcome back to another jam-packed episode of the Hammercast. I am joined once again by the inimitable Dave the Iron Tamer Whitley, and uh, with slightly shorter hair this time. I uh, I noticed I, he's yeah. gotten a, a bit of a trim since I think the last time he was on the show. We're going to be talking about his friend and mentor, Slim the Hammerman Farman, a gentleman and a giant, if ever there was one, in the world of strength training, and especially especially strongman. And uh, I'm going to be uh, very interested to hear some of the, the tales uh, that Dave has about Slim, as well as some of the stories that are going to help carry on the legacy of this guy. Because if you've never heard of him, let me assure you, he truly is a legend. And uh, Dave knew him better than most. And uh, I'm very excited to be able to talk about it. Uh, just as a brief note, um, if you haven't already, my nine-minute kettlebell and bodyweight challenge is free. If you go to 9minutechallenge.com. So if you haven't gotten that already, that is a good place to do it. And uh, I mean, who can say no to nine minutes free? I mean, really, like it, it couldn't get better than that. And I'm told that it works extremely well. Dave, I'll have to send you a copy so that you can, uh, you can vouch for that maybe in the future. But um, yeah. at any rate, yeah, thank you so much for being on. Um, really excited to do this show. Me too. Thank you for having me on again. And um, I'm very, very happy to be on, very happy to talk about the subject that we've talked about today. I was really pleased when um, when you messaged me. After, I wrote a little um, a little thing after Slim Pass last week and put it on my social media, sent it out to my email list and stuff, and I had a lot of people respond back with very kind things. Um, you were one of them, and you said, I want to know more about this guy. And you thought that the people who pay attention to what you have to say would want to know more about it. So we scheduled it. I suited up in my Mighty Adam t-shirt today, and um, I'm ready to talk about Slim. Hell yeah. Well, you know, first of all, we should mention the Mighty Adam, too, because uh, Slim was a, if I recall correctly, he was a student of the Mighty Adam. And uh, yeah, beautiful. And this, uh, I'm told this is a very difficult to get book. Is that correct? It is indeed. Yeah, um, it is indeed difficult to get. It's uh, I don't know what the cover price on it is when it was printed back in the day, but um, if you can find one of these on eBay or Amazon, the hardcover especially for under one hundred and fifty bucks, buy it and then let me know if you don't want to keep it. I'll buy it from you because mm -hmm. I have I have a few copies of it, but there it's out of print. Uh, there's a hardcover and a soft cover edition of it. Um, it is a fascinating story. And if you know how to read between the lines and you understand what you're reading, there is a wealth of both physical and esoteric information in the book. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that I have noticed is a big difference between the uh, old school strongman approach to training versus the training that uh, mostly proliferates now is there is like a, a chain of, uh, of students that go, you know, one back to the next. So we've got, you know, you are a student of uh, Dennis Rogers, who's a student of Slim Farman, who was a student of Mighty Adam, who was a Correct. student of, who was a champion, Valenko, if I'm Correct. not mistaken. So uh, it, it's like there, it, it's almost like martial arts in a sense, you know, oh, you've, totally. Got, totally. You, you've got like a lineage of, of people who learned one from another. And the, and the feats of strength that, that are carried down and passed down and the the insights that that you can glean from them are really second to none it's not the kind of thing that you can simply learn you know like from a like a weekend course or like an online thing i mean there's a really uh, there's a lot of of depth to it so tell us a little bit um apart from just my impressions what your experience has been being a part of of this lineage um there's a couple of ways I can approach this. I can work backwards from me or I can work chronologically forward from the Adam. So um, we, we may just go ahead. Let's, yeah, let's do uh, Adam to you. OK, um, in, in the book, the Mighty Adam book is it details um, his his life story from his early years. He was born 1893 in some small village in Poland that I'm not going to try to pronounce, because as you and I talked about um in Prague about six years ago, the UN really needs to airdrop some vowels into that part of the world. Because yes, very badly. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so he was born like in the poorest family of the poorest village in the poorest part of Poland during the late 1800s. And um, he was Jewish and that was not a particularly safe or healthy time to be a Jew either. So he had all of these things against him. He was born premature. Doctors told his parents that he would not live to see his 18 or his 14th birthday, I think is what it said in the book. Um, but he managed to make it in his throughout his childhood. He had this uh, a cough, some sort of lung respiratory thing that never seemed to get named in the book. And I think when he was about 14 years old, he went to the circus and um, snuck in and then got beat up by somebody um, basically for sneaking in and for being Jewish. Um, because in the book, it, it, the way that they were able to identify the, the guy who beat him up is that he didn't see the guy. All he did was hear the guy's voice saying, I'll kill you, you dirty little Jew. And when they, uh, the champion Blinko, who became his mentor, who was the wrestler and strongman in this traveling circus, saw the boy beat up, um, picked him up, took care of him and, and lined up all of these people who it might have been and had them repeat that same line that I don't even want to say again because it's so horrific and um, watch the boy's reaction when this one guy said it and so Valenko commenced to whip in his ass and that was over and done at that point point. Um, and so through that experience as it's detailed in the book the Adam um, literally ran away and joined the circus he didn't even tell his parents he was going he just like went and wrapped up some rags in another rag to pretend he had some possessions and became Valenko's um, valet for uh, about a couple of years, traveled from Poland all the way to India and back. Um, first thing that he learned was breathing exercises because Valenko said, this thing will kill you or you will kill it. And I can show you how to overcome it, but I can't do the work for you. So he started out teaching him how to breathe. There's a very interesting, um, which, which is fascinating to me as a student of breath work for decades now, that that was the place Valenko chose to start, um, whether that was because it was the most uh, obvious thing with um, young, uh, his name was Joseph Greenstein. And at that point, they, it, it was in the book, they call him Yossel. I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm not the, not the guy with the multiple languages, that's you. So if I say something that's just straight up Southern Tennessee guy, then Let's just go with that. Let's just absolutely that's the right. Way. No, I'm I'm here for the Southern Tennessee stuff. Yeah. Um, words like uh, words like fitna. fitna. I'm finna, yeah. I'm finna finish telling a story. <laughs> so anyway, um, <laughs> um, or the word fitness. If I keep eating so much, I'm not gonna be able to fitness pair of pants anymore. So anyway, um, he starts with these breathing exercises, and this entire chapter on his relationship with Valenko was really fascinating me the first time I read it because there's so much. Um, hidden knowledge buried in that particular chapter. We start with breath work. There's a description of the breathing exercises that he had him do that is just enough to know that he was doing something, but not enough to learn it from the book. Um, tangent, fortunately for me, uh, probably about eight or nine years ago, um, at an association of old time barbell and strongman banquet dinner, which was the yearly gathering that went on for a long time. Um, it stopped, I guess, two, three years ago. Um, COVID might have been the thing that shut that down, or it might have stopped in 2019. I'm not sure which one it was, um, but I was there, and uh, the last time I saw any of those guys, uh, Slim and, and the rest of them, was at that dinner a few years ago. But anyway, um, the Mighty Adams um, second to youngest son, Mike Greenstein, was perpetually there, and his youngest son, Jerry, was also there. And his grandson, Stephen Greenstein, actually uh, did a documentary about the Mighty Adam that is um, out there in various different places. Too. Like, if you search for it, you'll find it. Very interesting movie about a very interesting man. Um, anyway, I sat down with Mike, who was in his early 90s at this point, because he was, I think he was 95 when he passed away. So he was somewhere around 90 ish and still very coherent and very, very spry. I mean, he would, he would carry on conversations and he walked around and, and um, I think this was, might've been the same year that he replicated a feat that he hadn't done since the sixties, where he, a feat of his dad's where he had um, a bar bent across the bridge of his nose, like a bar that was maybe, maybe two feet long. And they put pipes on the end of it and had two guys on either side 
He leans his head back, puts the bar across the bridge of his nose with just a bar napkin, like a, like you would set a beer on in a bar, folded up over the bridge of his nose and had these guys pull down on it and bend it. And they bend it maybe 30 degrees, 40 degrees, something like that. And um, I had I just happened to be right there front and center getting video of it. So it was really cool. And I asked him later on, when's the last time you did that? Feed? And he says, probably about 1967. So he hadn't done it in 40 years, right? Or 50 years, I guess. Um, my math's a little bit off. But anyway, um, I had the opportunity to sit down and talk with him. And I asked him about some of the specifics of the Mighty Adams breathing techniques because he was one of the guys that continued on um, doing the, the strongman stuff from his dad. It was Mighty Adam and Sons for a while. Um, by the time I met Mike, all of his older brothers had already gone because this was a long time ago that this was happening, you know, in the 30s and 40s. Um, but he explained to me how some of the breathing exercises worked. And then a few years later, I run across Wim Hof and lo and behold, it's almost identical. Wow. So it's, it's really fascinating to me that these breathing exercises that Wim Hof does, which we've talked about that before, boosting the immune system in the book. Um, there's a, a passage talking about Valenko doing breathing exercises and grabbing handfuls of snow and rubbing them all over his body. So he's practicing cold exposure and for all these things to come to a point like that. And then for Mike to explain to me the, how the breathing technique worked and to be so similar to the Wim Hof stuff that I was already looking at and practicing and knowing that all of that came from generally the same area in Europe, you know, Poland, uh, Amsterdam, all around that general area in Europe is, in Europe is fascinating to me. But um, after his tenure with the circus, the mighty Adam uh, regained his health learned how to wrestle, learned how to get stronger. And there's a very interesting thread that runs through that chapter of where Belenko has him take empty buckets. And he says he raises them over his head. There's no real description of how he's doing it, but he's coordinating the movement with his breath and the buckets are very light. And every day Belenko will throw a handful of sand into the bucket so that over the course of time, he winds up with these heavy buckets that may have weighed 30, 40, 50 pounds each. I don't even, I don't have no idea how much they weighed to begin with, but contained in that story, we have matching the breath with the movement. We have progressive overload and practice of a movement. We have the consistency of doing something and doing it, making it slightly more difficult and expanding that comfort zone that I've talked about with you before about how busting out of your comfort zone is how you injure yourself, expanding your comfort zone to engulf your old limit to paraphrase Paul McElroy and Adam glass and Frankie Ferris is the way to continually perpetually make progress. So it's fascinating to me that in the midst of all this from, you know, 125, 130 years ago, that's going on are these same principles. And that just reinforces to me that they're universal principles. During his travels, he winds up in um, India and he meets the legendary wrestler Gama, who talks to him about um, training. Because after he sees Gama do this match with an opponent that is much bigger than him and Gama just makes short work of him. He just, he owns the guy and flicks his will on him. And so he asks him, says, that man was so much bigger than you. And he says, and yes, I handled him with ease. And he's like, how did you do that? And he says, well, every day since I was a boy, I would take my belt and I would tie it around a tree and I would try to throw the tree. And he said, and so the Adam says to him, well, did you, did you ever do it? And he said, no, but after... 20 years with a tree throwing a man is very easy. So what do we have there? We have isometrics, right? Yeah. We have specific skill practice of throwing and from a martial arts standpoint done, strengthening it gradually over many, many years through isometrics. So there's so much information in this book from a physical training standpoint. Um, but more appealing to me um, is the esoteric standpoint. I, I sort of, coined the phrase when I read this, this is metaphysical culture is what this is. Mm -hmm. um, he, he talks about um, after he finishes his time in the circus, he goes back, marries this girl that he loved from the village, the people in the very Tom Sawyer, the people in the village thought he was dead and he shows up and he's not and he's healthy. Now he winds up moving to the US. He spent some time in Japan studying jujitsu as like a merchant marine on a boat over there, whatever. Um, but 
at one point when he's living in Texas, when he's probably in, I think he's in his early twenties. Um, he's married, got a couple kids. Um, and the, the details of, of how he wound up in this position are a little bit too long to go into for right now. But um, the short version of the story is this other guy shot him in the face with a handgun and the bullet, instead of penetrating his skull and killing him, flattened out on his skull for some reason. And um, he apparently kept this, this slug that was flattened out like a nickel for a long time. I've never seen it. I don't know where it is anymore, but apparently he hung on to that. And that moment of, of looking death in the face and, and not dying um, triggered this huge interest that was already brewing in him in things that are spiritual and metaphysical. So he started a serious study of the Kabbalah and of the Torah and he started looking into Jewish mysticism and everything that he could could find in there. And he wound up um, to, to paint that with a very broad brush, fascinated with the idea of what he called life force, which if you go to Asia, you know, in, in Chinese, they would call that chi. In, uh, in India, they might call it prana, pranayama. So um, he found the common link that connects all the things together with what is it that actually makes us alive but and not just from a contemplative monk in a cave on a mountain standpoint but from a very practical standpoint he realized that he could focus his mind in such a way to call on this esoteric energy to do things like Ben Steele <clears throat> fast forward to me following in his footsteps and, and emulating this stuff um when I've Typically, if I'm especially if I'm working on something that's that's particularly difficult, like a piece of steel that's that's right at the edge of my ability, um, I will concentrate my mind and think in such a way that I am projecting my will between the molecules of the steel and pushing them out of the way to make room so that it'll bend easier. Um, am I is that actually happening? Don't know, can't measure it. Um, does it make me stronger in the moment? Yes, it absolutely does. Um, so um, that's one of the things that I kind of gleaned from that and adapted to my own. Um, eventually, he wound up in the uh, northeastern United States in uh, Pennsylvania, and he was doing, um, he'd studied a lot of, of uh, natural health remedy stuff, herbal things. Um, he was basically a, a naturopath doctor, and he um, had an entrepreneurial streak that apparently didn't do very well, according to most people, but he was consistently selling things like um, um, supplements and he would do feats of strength with his hair. So he would do things like a uh, uh, couple different occasions. He stopped an airplane from taking off. He would regularly pull trucks and cars with his, with his hair, have um, very strong grown men grab hair on either side and do tug of war with his head, that kind of stuff. So he marketed, he developed and marketed a, a shampoo and soap that was all natural and he would like, you know, wash his hair with it and he would eat it while he was doing his pitches at this, at, um, he had a truck that he set up and he, and he pedaled his wares out of and he would do feats of strength and to keep the crowd's attention. And then he would deliver his message to sell his products, which is completely what I adopted as a strong man doing corporate performances. Right. <laughs> and, um, Slim told me that, that you would sit and watch him and he would pick up a horseshoe or a nail or something and start wrapping it up as he was talking and the crowd would start to grow and he would set it down and then go into his lecture and make his pitch and sell stuff and never actually bend the piece. Um, he was just using that as, as a way to lure people in. And then by the end of the night, he would, he would, you know, do a few feats or whatever, but he was very good at the showmanship aspect of stuff. So Slim, um, came to know the Adam from the time he was a little boy. Um, the Adam used to perform at a place called Zern's Market there in um, around Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which is where Slim lives or lived. Um, and Slim would go every week and just sit and watch the old man talk like his parents would take him to the to the market and drop him off there. And then they would go around and do whatever business they had to do while he he watched uh, the Adam do his thing. And so he grew up doing that every weekend. And Slim talked about later on that when he started uh, dating Shirley, who he was married to for many years, she passed away a few years ago. <clears throat> he, 
that um, on whatever night it was, like Friday or Saturday night, that was what they did. That was their date night. They went and they sat and watched him. And he said for years he never talked to, to the Adam. Um, Slim came from a rough blue collar background in the um the story that he told me is that in the 11th grade in an, uh, a school assembly they voted him least likely to succeed at life and he stood up in the school assembly gave everybody one of these walked out walked down to the rock quarry and started working and he retired from that rock quarry. so he worked there for what 40 50 years right um how did slim develop his base level of strength breaking stone with a sledgehammer, loading that stone up on either the truck or conveyor belt or whatever it was that he had to do. And um, he, he said that initially it was very hard work for him, but after a while doing it, you know, 10, 12 hours a day, five, six, seven days a week, he said it became as easy as like folding clothes. So he started looking for other ways to get stronger, <clears throat> started playing with his hammers, leveraging them, and and doing various things like that and people would 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 uh like he said one night he was in the quarry it was after hours and he was he got paid by the ton and i forget what it was i want to say it was like it's like i'm not even gonna try to remember what the the amount was um but it was it was a significant amount of money for the the period of time and um i ran the numbers on it once when he told me and he was he was doing um on a good week, he was earning like seven or eight hundred dollars a week. This is in the forties and fifties, right? So he was. Um, Ed Spielman in the book talks about how Slim literally smashed his way out of poverty with a sledgehammer by breaking stone. Wow! So he had this this remarkable work ethic, and he had this idea that um, if someone else could do it, then he could do it too, no matter what it was. And so he's watching. Um, watching the ad and, and i realize i'm kind of all over the place and i might be going off tangents here so if i leave something uh if i start a story and don't finish it i apologize ahead of time because this is not scripted um he's he said he's watching the adam do his thing one night and that the adam says um how is it that that i an old man among all of you young people because he was probably in his 60s by this point um am the only one that can bend this spike and he like holds up a 60 penny nail and he says, I'm the only one here that can do this. And I'm so much older than you. And he, Slim says, and he looked directly at me. <laughs> he said, I don't know why, but I fired back. You ain't talking to me, old man. <laughs> and um, the Adam says, well, do you think you can bend it? And Slim says, well, if you can do it, I certainly can. And he's never tried to do this ever in his life. But for some yeah. reason, this, this connection was happening. And he took it as a, as a personal challenge. So the Adam says, well, come on up. And he wraps the nail and he hands it to him and says, and the Adam, if you know anything about bending, the Adam bent double underhand, which is starting in this position and the hands wind up in this position, right? Well, Slim held on to it and it, he said it didn't feel right. So he takes it this way. And the Adam's like, no, you have to do it the other way. You'll never be able to bend it that way. He tried it, couldn't do it. So he put his hands in a position that was comfortable and then he bent it. <laughs> Now there's differing, different accounts of this story, depending on when you talk to Slim, he would publicly say that he'd been it pretty easy. Um, but he's also privately said that he decided he was either going to bend that thing or he was going to die right there in front of everybody because he would rather die than break his word to himself. He said that it, he, he was sore for two days after that, just bending that one nail, which is pretty fascinating to, to look at what he was able to do later on and to understand that at his starting point, this novel stimulus of bending the nail, which he was strong enough to do, even with very primitive technique, um, put that kind of soreness on him. Now, obviously, after he realized he could do it, he refined his technique. So his technique improved, his um, tissues got more conditioned, his ligaments and tendons and all of that got stronger, able to handle the force, um, which is an interesting observation because so many people that I've talked to over the years who have injured themselves doing something physical, it's, it's very often a tendon or a ligament that their muscular strength and their ability to access the neural component of their muscular strength has outrun their connective tissue. And so the weakest link snaps, mm -hmm. um, particularly people who very rapidly get big and strong in a bodybuilding or powerlifting sense using performance enhancing drugs. The muscles, <coughs> excuse me, 
the muscles can get way stronger, way faster than the connective tissue, mm -hmm. primarily because there's such a low blood supply to the connective tissue. You know, if you if you cut your skin, it heals in a few days. If you break a bone, it heals in a few weeks. If you rip a muscle, it heals in a few days. If you bust a tendon or a ligament, there's very little blood going to that. It takes months for it to heal up because there's just less nutrients available and the recovery time's longer. So the first attempt that he made, Slim the Hammer Man, bending that nail he was able to do it in front of the mighty adam and he did it in a way that the mighty adam said it couldn't be done so mighty adam um took it upon himself to to help guide this guy but from what i understand it was a very frustrating process for slim because um mighty adam was not able to or not willing to um convey verbally exactly what was going on with this life force thing it was like you already know how to do it. Now you just have to practice it. And he's like, no, there's secrets to this. I know there has to be. And um, he uh, eventually said he woke up in the middle of the night and he's like, this is all in the mind. And he goes to, to the mighty Adam, Joe. He says, Joe, I've got it figured out. Tell me if I'm right. This is, you're using your mind. This is not your body. And he's like, yeah, you've got it. He says, okay, teach me. He's like, I can't teach you something you already know. You just have to keep practicing. Um, another cool story that Slim told is that leveraging the sledgehammer on the ground. So you have a sledgehammer lying on the ground um, and the handle is, um, most folks use a pad. Um, the handle is sitting on a pad and you use just wrist strength to hold on to it, but you move your body in such a way that you leverage that hammer to vertical. A 16 pound sledgehammer um, on a 31 inch handle, which is what Slim used and what I consequently used. Um, at 16 pounds, the way you calculate the amount of inch pounds torque needed to, um, to lift that. And I, if my math terms are a little bit off, I apologize. I don't really study this stuff, but this is what I've been told. Um, it takes, you multiply the weight of the hammer times the length of the handle. So 16 pounds times 31 inches is I think 496 pounds of torque, inch pounds that it takes to raise that hammer up to vertical. Same thing if you've got it vertical and you lower it down to your nose and take it back up. <clears throat> and that happens on a curve because that's the, that's the highest point of it, but you, you understand what I'm saying there. So the mighty Adam asked Slim, do you have anything else that you can do besides bend this spike? And he's like, yeah, I can leverage his sledgehammer. He says, well, bring your hammer next week and show me. So Slim says he brings the hammer. He sets it down on the floor, tells mighty Adam what he's going to do. And mighty Adam's like, no, nobody can do that. That's impossible. Slim proceeds to do it, like bring it up and back down three or four times. And every single time he did it, he says, the old man sitting there shaking his hand going, that's not possible. That's not possible. Um, from, from that, uh, the Adam encouraged him to start uh, to devise a means to add weight to the hammers. And he started progressively adding more weight to it. I have video of, of Slim in the mid eighties doing a show where he effortlessly levers a 24 pound hammer. Wow. I haven't done the math on that, but 24 times 31 is a lot. And his official world record that he did with two hammers, which are joined together, both hands on it was um, 59, the official world record was 56 and a half pounds, I think, um, which is over 1,100 pounds of torque. Slim um, also said privately that he had done 69 and a half pounds as his all-time best, but there was no video record of it. Um, so um, I believe him. I have no reason to doubt him, but uh, that was never done publicly. That was done like in the, in the dungeon out behind his house where he trained. Um, he took it upon himself to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And he set up this uh, training area in a little shed out behind his house, which eventually became a museum. Um, I was fortunate enough to visit it several times. There was all this memorabilia from the Mighty Adam, all this memorabilia from these other strong men of the era that he had collected. And also stuff from the younger guys uh, like Dennis Rogers and Dennis's generation and all of us that came in the next generation, it was just full of, of really cool museum quality stuff. And um, also that's where he trained. So he would train there um, allegedly every single night for two or three hours a night. Um, I'm sure that there were times he had days off, but you know, part of the legend is not questioning the legend. So um, yeah. 
he he developed showmanship. He developed um, the ability to look incredibly good in front of a crowd um, by studying what the vaudeville era guys were doing and by studying various different entertainers and, and by really taking it not just I'm going to do this thing that is very strong and most people can't do, but I'm going to look good doing it. And he was one of the guys that instilled in me the idea that if you're going to go on stage and you fail a feat, then it, it, it better be because something really terrible happened to you and they have to carry you off. And he said, but you don't want to do that on purpose. And he instilled in me the idea that if you're going to go on stage and do something, you need to be, unless you're, unless you're doing like a world record attempt or something, you know, if it's just a, a show for a general audience, <clears throat> keep everything within the ability of you knowing that you can do it. It can be right on the edge of comfort, but don't go into an area. Don't try to do something on stage you've never done before mm -hmm. as part of a regular practice, which lines up perfectly with the same stuff that, that we've talked about from guys like Arthur Saxon, Eugene Sandow, Thomas Inch, Earl Lederman, all of those guys. Um, when they would perform, they would be doing something that was otherworldly, but it was usually about 70, 75% of what they were truly capable of. Because the fact is, it's your job to do that. Nobody wants to see you mess up. They want to be entertained and amazed. And the other fact is, if you've done it the way that these guys are talking about, no one in the audience is going to be able to do it anyway, even though it's fairly easy for you. They're not going to be able to do it anyway, because you've practiced this to such a point that you've, you've become superhuman, right? Um, so I met Dennis Rogers in 2006 or so, and I told that story before, so we're not going to go deep into that. But um, I went up to the association of old time barbell and strongman banquet dinner after i'd started training with dennis and became very interested in stuff so i could meet these guys my very first um um experience in meeting slim the hammer man live um dennis had told me he will be, he will probably be a little bit gruff and a little bit rude because that's how he is with the new guys because that's how his generation and his geography interpreted respect you know, he was, he was a tough guy. And, um, there's, there's some stories that, that I know about him outside of training, just personal life stuff where I'm like, yeah, that was kind of a mean thing to do to another person, but whatever, you know, I don't, I don't want to go into those stories sure. <clears throat> right now, but, um, so slim comes in and I'm just, I'm just watching him move around because if, you know, I'm, I'm a student of movement. I'm a student of, um, esoteric energies and so i'm really really watching how he moves physically and also what the just energetically is going on around him um oh i, I left this part out during during his time when he was training with the adam and he was working in the rock quarry um there was a moment where um he something happened he was he was trying to get a bunch of rock to fall into this thing to go into a conveyor belt and it comes out the other side or i don't know exactly the mechanics of how it works but he winds up falling into this thing and getting buried alive underneath tons and tons of, of rock and it they were bigger rocks and um it was situated in such a way that he getting, didn't get crushed but he couldn't move and no one could hear him um when i first met him i asked about this particular story because this was fascinating to me because um it was another account of a human being living through something that he probably shouldn't have lived through and coming out the other side, a changed person. Cause that was like the, the switch for slim and like really focusing in on the, the mental aspect of stuff. He told me that he fell, <coughs> got buried and he was like this and said he couldn't breathe. Just happened to have his hands over his face. And he said that he was very calmly calculating in his mind what it would take to get through this rock and to get out the side of this container, whatever it was. And he very quickly realized that there's no way I'm done. I'm stuck here. This is how it ends for me. But then uh, somebody turned the machine on the rock falls out on the conveyor belt and he comes out in the conveyor belt um, with, I think he had a broken rib and he was bleeding and, and busted up a little bit, but, but uh, he like stood up and dusted himself off and everybody was looking at him. He's like, what are you looking at? Get back to work is how the story goes. And um, 
Um, he may or may not have gone to the doctor. I'm pretty sure that he did, but I think in the book it says that he just went back to work. I don't think that that's necessarily accurate, but I asked Slim about that particular story, and he said that he could vividly remember. He got, he got really quiet because apparently no one had asked them this. They wanted to ask him about feats of strength and, and you know, performing, and and they wanted to joke with him and all that kind of stuff. But I asked him this question, and I think that that's how I got over with him initially was by asking him about this particular aspect of stuff. He said he was just buried there like that. And he he had literally accepted the fact that he was not going to come out of there. And then he came out. And that put him on the path of like um, really thinking about what is what is the mind truly capable of and how can I express that with the body? So he got very serious about his training after that. He, um, <clears throat> at this first banquet dinner, which I think it might have been 2008, maybe 2009. I'm not 100% sure when it was. <clears throat> he comes walking in, and I'm watching him, and he looks over at me, and I make eye contact with him, and he holds eye contact just a little bit longer than most people do and then just goes back to talking to because you know, he knows all these people. They all know him. He's a legend. They're there to see him, all that kind of stuff. And this eye contact thing happened several times. He was working his way closer to where I was sitting. And finally, he's about 10 feet away from me, and we lock eyes again for the third or fourth time. And he comes walking over to me and gets right up close to me and says, you going to take a swing at me, boy? And I'm like, no, no, sir. I just want to shake your hand. And I go to shake his hand, and shaking his hand was best described by um, Pat Povolitis, the who is a legend in his own right at Ben and Steel. He said, shaking hands with Slim the Hammer Man is putting your hand in a vice that smiles at you. Because he would just, he would put this pressure on and there was literally nothing you could do about it. You know, there's, and, and that was with his right hand and he was left-handed. That wasn't even his dominant hand, but he was, he would put that pressure on. And I know that there are ways to position your hand and ways to like work around someone who's trying to aggressively, you know, be a dick and, and crush your hand like that. None of that worked with him. His strength was beyond the level of being able to circumvent it with any kind of little technical trick or anything like that so i just endured it for a minute and um told him it was great to meet him and um he let go and he wandered around a little bit and i'm like okay i met slim the hammer man and then several times over the course of that afternoon i circled back around and and like he had a few things there he would come and he had some mighty adam books and some posters and stuff that he would sell so i bought some stuff from him talked to him a little bit that was when i asked him the story about falling into the um the rock pit thing <laughs> and um then everybody sort of cleans up goes back to the room and comes down for the actual dinner so there's this afternoon thing and people who collect strength memorabilia are out there basically doing you know comic con swapping and there's presentations and all that kind of stuff then it breaks for a couple hours then everybody reconvenes in the banquet hall for the dinner which typically they would um honor two or three people on in each given year um that i got to be there the year they honored mike Katz, which was cool um he was in pumping iron with uh, arnold and all those guys i was there with the vander holyfield got to meet vander holyfield that way wow. um which he's just a cool cool guy you know um but i saw slim back at the banquet table and because i knew and had been training with dennis Dennis was able to get me a seat at the table with him and Slim. So I got to hang out with him and talk to him more then. Then after the ceremonies are over with, people would tend to con convene in the lobby. And, you know, there, there was a bar. And so you have strong men who've been putting them away. And it's 11 o'clock at night. And they only get to see each other every so often. So people start bending stuff and breaking stuff and having fun and, and, and doing all that. I managed to... Um, wind up sitting with Slim, talking to him again, and he and he asked me what feats I do, what I what I was working on, that kind of stuff. And I told him about my experience with the nail drive, which I had. Uh, um, I think I've talked about that previously with you, where I had a great deal of difficulty with a big mental block. I could feel myself slowing down, and finally I got past that. And so I told him, was telling Slim about it, and he's like, "Well, yeah, it's in your mind. You've got the power there already. It's just can you get to it." And he would, he would say that like every hour when, when you'd be around him, he would just constantly remind you that that power is already in there. And um, so he's like, well, let me show you some stuff that you don't know. And he takes out um, 
I don't have it laying close by, but I put a, a picture of it on my uh, Facebook post where I was talking about him. It's like a little, you have a message from thing from the hotel. He flipped it over on the back and he drew out these diagrams of, of how to make the wraps for the nail and how to make it safer by gluing a piece of leather in the center. And um, because you want as much safety as possible. And if you watch Slim do his nail drive feet, he will put the nail in there into the, the wrap and every single time he'll put his hand on the board <clears throat> as he's getting ready, he'll put the point of the nail in his mouth and then he'll get in position to do the thing. And he says, says, have you noticed that I do that? And I'm like, yeah. He says, you know why I do that? And I said, no, tell me. And he says, I'm focused on what I'm doing to the point that it's possible that I could put the wrong end of the nail in my, into the wrap and then put it through my hand. So when I put that in my mouth, that part of my mind knows that if I don't feel that point in my mouth, something's off and I'll completely start over. And if you watch the way he does stuff in video, every time he approaches the hammer for a particular feat, if it's set up a certain way, he might start with his left foot every single time on this one feat. Every time he does a nail drive, he puts the um, nail in his mouth. Every time he wraps something, he wraps it the same way. On another hammer feet that requires him to be in a different position, he might take three steps instead of two. But he said, all of that looks like showmanship and it, there is an air, a, a, a component of showmanship to it. But he says, the reason that I do that every single time the same way is to eliminate any possibility of mistake, any possibility of setting myself up for something to go wrong. I'm controlling as many variables as I can. He says that he has many times walked out to do a feat and he has this red rug that he would carry with him. And he sets that up on the stage and he says, that rug is mine and I own it. And anyone that sets foot on it, I own them too. And I know that they know it. So if someone would come up to lift his challenge hammer, they weren't, they would be in the audience one moment, but when they set foot on his rug, they were in his universe and he rules that universe. I'm like, that is a really fascinating way to look at it. Um, and the interesting thing about it that parallels another experience that I had was training uh, at a uh, seminar with Marty Gallagher and Kirk Kowarski. If you watch Kirk Kowarski walk up to a squat bar, it is identical every single time, whether the bar has 225 on it or whether it has a thousand pounds on it. And um, Kirk said, if he walks up and gets under the bar and something doesn't feel exactly right, he'll re-rack it, walk away, kind of shake it off and then start over again. He'll hit reset, essentially. Slim said the same thing. <clears throat> if there's a speck of lint on my rug, when I walk up to the, the hammers, I'll move the lint, turn around, and then start my approach over again. Because everything, um, he actually compared it to a, um, a commercial jet pilot's checklist. You know, it's that important that every single thing go exactly the same. And there's going to be variables from time to time that you can't control, but that kind of consistency and that kind of attention to detail in his training bled over into every aspect of my life. It bled over into, into how I conduct business with my clients, you know? Um, so he talked to me about that. He drew this diagram out um, on how to make the wraps. He drew a diagram on, on how the grain of the wood is and the way that the wood is sawed and said you can look at the side of the board and to see if the grain is slanted this way or the grain slanted that way and line yourself up because when you drive the nail it doesn't go in exactly straight it'll go at a slight angle and he says what you want to do is you want to match if the grain is going this way you want to match that nail angle because that gives it just a little bit less resistance because you're going with the grain rather than against the grain on the nail drive. And I'm like, that is absolutely fascinating. Um, <clears throat> so just tons and tons of, of little things like that. I, uh, my computer's not plugged in, so I'm going to plug it in real quick. I'm going to take sure, it. Go for it. One thing I want to say while you're doing that is that uh, one of the interesting things that I'm noticing from all of this is that um, I think the audience can take away is something that's going to be true for not just strength training, but anything is that there are universal principles to things. The way you do one thing really is the way you do everything. Yep. And the, the setup for anything is incredibly important. So whether it is setting up for a strength feat, whether it's setting up for, you know, meeting a new client at your job, it's extremely important. Having a, like a, a routine or a ritual, rituals are incredibly important. And, you know, you mentioned the checklist thing. Um, 
that's exactly what pilots do. Um, that's exactly what Slim did. I, there's a great book called No by a guy named Jim Camp, who was one of the, he was called the world's most feared negotiator when he was still alive. And he talked about checklists a lot. He would make sure his team had checklists for here's how we're going to approach everybody within our, uh, within our sphere when we're doing the negotiation. So people should take away from this that strongman stuff, in addition to getting you extremely strong, the, the, the lessons you're going to learn from it are things that are going to carry you through any other discipline you could possibly want. Everything is the same. It's just being applied in a different sphere. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if something seems difficult, um, it can be deconstructed into such a way that it can be done in, in a step-by-step -step manner. And all you have to do then is practice, mm -hmm. practice the step-by-step. Which was an incredibly valuable insight that was reinforced. And I mean, it sounds so simple, but self evident truth is like that. I mean, that's the definition of self evident, right? Um, yeah. th there's been many times that something has occurred to me and I've phrased it in a particular way. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And it just felt like this big epiphany. And I'll go and I'll tell somebody and they'll be like, well, yeah, sure. And I'm like, whenever I get that reaction and I know that they didn't think of it before, but they're like, well, yeah, sure, that makes sense. I'm like, that's because that, that no one can argue the, the self-evident truth that's going on with that, right? Yeah. Um, after that meeting with Slim and, and everything that I took away from it, um, a few months later was when I went to the, uh, I think it was the same workshop I was talking about with Marty and Kirk, mm -hmm. um, which wound up being, or maybe it was, I don't know. It was, it was, it was some workshop up in that area of, of town. There was a couple of different one was the uh easy shift workshop that Pavel and Dan John did and Bud Jeffries was there that was maybe 20 minutes away from Slim's house so I went a day early and hung out with Slim you know every time that, that there was an event that I could be a part of that was near him I would I would pad an extra day in so I could go hang out with him um <clears throat> I had been working on the leverage lift from the floor and I talked about this in my little tribute that I wrote for him um that I could, I had a 12 pound hammer and a 16 pound hammer. And at the time I didn't have a way to um, incrementally add weight to it. So I went to visit him and it was just me and him, which was one of the coolest uh, experiences I ever had. We're out in the dungeon doing the thing. And he had his 12 pound sledgehammer, uh, challenge hammer. And um, he said, can you do this? And I'm like, I, I'd love to give it a shot. And so I, I get down in position, I lever it up and I let it back down. And he gets almost offended looking. He's like, who showed you how to do that boy? And I'm like, well, you did <laughs> because I've watched videos and I've dissected what you do. And I figured it out from watching you. And he says, well, you're close, but you need to do this. And this. And he like made some, some minor adjustments on stuff. Mm. And um, I tried that and it felt a little bit easier. And he says, so what's the most weight you've ever done? I said, well, 12 pounds, because the next highest thing that I have is 16 pounds and uh, I'm not able to lift it yet. I can get it about that far off the ground. So he grabs a few plates and throws them on and tightens it up and checks everything out. And, um, you know, I'm, there, I'm on his rug that we were talking about earlier, which um, he had explained that. And later on after this, he explained that, that because that's his rug and that's in his space and that's his house and he owns everything that's in it, he felt like he could communicate better what to do um, because I was a guest in his house at that point. And I was like, um, I realized what he was saying is we were, we were doing what we could to match energetic frequencies. Right. And so he, um, um, he says, give this a shot. It's 15 and three quarter pounds. I said, okay. And so I brought it up and it, it goes up and kind of falls over to the side. And he's like, okay, those adjustments I was talking about, do this and this, and it's like just little subtle shifts. Like where my, my, um, foot on the non-loaded side was I moved it a little bit and I lean back and it comes up and it gets to about 45 degrees and collapses down <clears throat> and um I knew that I had I had done the technique exactly as he had described it and he did too and he suddenly just shifts gears from from being very intense and and telling me what to do he backs up and he, he would put his hands under his arms like this and he sniffed a lot um I think because of damage to his nose from bending bars across it and he had this, this little whistle in his voice and he would rock back and forth like this and he said did i ever tell you about the garden and i knew he was talking about madison square garden it's in the book and i'm like no slim you didn't he said well adam called me up said pack your stuff we're going to the garden 
karate tournament thing. And they had the ring set up and there was 20,000 people at Madison Square Garden. And I had determined I was going to break the record then on his double hammer lift. And so he said, um, I'm going to stop trying to talk like him now because I'm messing it up. But he said that he was warming up backstage. You know, you're on in 30 minutes. So he starts warming up and they come, come back. He's ready to go. It's like, it's been shifted. It's going to be at least an hour. We'll come back and tell you. So they come back an hour later. He warms up again. And this happened a couple of times. So he warmed up and cooled down. <clears throat> and essentially um, um, used up everything that he had warming up and cooling down. So they're like, okay, you're for sure going on this time, whatever. And um, this is going to happen. So he starts warming up again and he feels something pop in his wrist and he actually injured himself at this point and um, was, was like, I'm not gonna be able to do this. Um, the book accounts this a little bit differently than the way he told it to me, but uh, you know, let's not let any facts get in the way of a good story here. Right. He said that um, he had was back and forth in his own mind about whether or not he was going to take weight off. And, and he's like, but I told him I was going to break the record and said the mighty Adam came in and said, what's wrong slim. Cause he could immediately tell. And he's like, well, I hurt my wrist. I told these people I'm going to do the record. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it or not. And he said the mighty Adam walks over to his hammers and gets slim in position. And he puts his hand like this so that, that, all he can see is the, the handle. He can't see the head of the hammer anymore. And he said, Slim, all I see is a stick. Can you pick up the stick? And Slim's like, yeah. And so he goes out, he breaks the record. And that was like the lesson that he learned. And, um, and he says, so, okay, um, put your hand in that position. And he's talking to me now. And, and, and just look at the handle of the hammer. Just look where your hand is. Your other hand's here. You can't see the head of the hammer. Do you see a stick? And I said, yeah. And he says, are you strong enough to pick up a stick? And I said, yeah. He says, well, pick up the damn stick, boy. And I levered it back. And it just, it literally floated right up into position. And I dropped it back down. And he let out this, this, woo, that was, it was, it was Ric Flair. It really yeah. was. And he like does the bro hug handshake thing to me, which was like the most emotional, affectionate display I'd ever seen the man do. And, you know, it brings tears to my eyes. And he like grabs me by the shoulders and shakes me and says, that feels good, don't it, boy? And I'm like, yeah, it does. Please just stop squeezing me, you know? <laughs> so, like, from that, being able to, to take that and compare it to something completely unrelated and um, um, seemingly unrelated, but that can apply to anyone, um, you and I both know and are friends with and have read and studied psych psycho cybernetics and we're friends with Matt Fury. Yeah. And we, we both understand how that works. That was part of my studies and learning how to, to do goal achievement, personal development, all that stuff. Matt literally last week was talking about um, lifting something heavy and seeing it as heavy and straining with it. But then like in his mind, picturing it as light, I think it was it was like a, a heavy club and he started picturing it as being a feather and mm -hmm. you could see the change it, it like he wasn't pretending in the video you could see the change in the amount of effort that he had there and it's like so you can do this you know with anything that seems difficult you can turn it into something that is easier in your mind um, by recalling something that is easy that you've already done. So picking up the stick and the entire philosophy of psycho cybernetics is exactly the same in my mind, um, which is, you know, in any of the, any of the differences or discrepancies or just discussion of details, it's like how much salt do you put in a recipe? It, 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 but if we're talking about a steak, it's a piece of meat right now, how you season it may be slightly different, but it's all a steak. Right? So for me, that was a huge connecting factor. Um, because what the mighty Adam was saying in the book, was, uh, the Valenko actually told him this. And, and I quote, I quote it as a quote from the Adam because it kind of blends together. I, I do this in shows. I don't want to like um, overload people with too much information, but the mighty Adam quote is never be inhibited by the seemingly impossible place, no limit on yourself. And you'll have none. If you think that you're strong, then you are. And I realized you can replace any other word with the word strong. And it's still true. If you think that you're weak, then you are. If you think that you're wealthy, if you think that you're poor, healthy, sick, whatever, <clears throat> it all starts with that thought. Then with Slim, it's like you already had the power. You are unable to access the power because of the fear. How are you going to get the power out? 
and you know, then ultimately Dennis Rogers telling me with the story that I've told about the nail drive before, um, that the mind is, and you have to remove all doubt and limitation from your mind because your mind controls your body. All of that is saying the same thing, that whatever we think about is what we become and whatever we believe on the deepest level is going to express itself on the external, even if we consciously do not accept that that's what we're, that, that that's what we believe. Mm -hmm. And so all of the work that I do now with personal development is identifying what your conflicting belief is in relation to what your desired outcome is and resolving that. And the lifting the hammer versus picking up the stick with slim was a moment in time that like before that moment, I didn't understand it. After that moment, it's so incredibly vibrantly HD clear to me in, in IMAX that I can never not know it again. Mm -hmm. So realizing that and being able to transfer that concept from lifting things into anything else is, has been monumental to me. So that's why in the little tribute that I wrote to him, I said that every time I have a coaching session with a client, um, like I, I had a session last night with a guy who is an electrician and his, his main thing that he's doing right now is figuring out what, how he needs to think differently so that he can run his own business instead of work for somebody else. Sounds completely divorced from lifting a hammer. And it is, except that it's not because it's all the same thing. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It's um, like I said earlier, I mean, it, it really is amazing just how many of these lessons can be applied to anything and why it's so important that you find one thing to be good at and uh, take it upon yourself, not just to, uh, to, ask for permission from other people to, to accomplish something, but to actually play with things yourself. Like you, you had a great uh, example when you were talking about slim and uh, you know, going up to the mighty Adam and leveraging a hammer at, and, and Adam thought, well, no, it's not possible. Nobody can do it. So slim didn't need to ask anybody permission to do it. He, he was just too busy doing it. Yeah. And that so it's often bumblebee. It's, yeah. it's the bumblebee effect. Exactly. Exactly. And for folks who don't know what that means, I think, I guess, technically speaking, bumblebees should not like physically should not be able to fly. And yet they do. And uh, because no one told the bumblebee that he's too busy flying. Exactly. Exactly. This is a perfect example of it. And, and I think it's uh, it's excellent that you're helping people to kind of break down these these misconceptions that they have. And you have a you have a great example of how you were able to knock one down using the principles, the universal principles and the practices that you learn from Slim Farman. And you're now able to help people translate that into their business, uh, into all manner of other disciplines. And uh, like the saying goes, it's on the back of all of our currency, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Many different things you might want to accomplish, but there is just one thing quite often that you have to do, one, one set of skills you need to have, and you can apply it to anything. Exactly. Yeah, that's excellent. I. I'm very happy that you came on and I am, uh, I'm very happy you were able to impart some of this to people because I, I hope people will listen to this episode multiple times to glean some of the information that, uh, that you've put out there because this is stuff that you, know, you haven't come up with. You're, you're simply imparting it from the people who learned it from other people who learned it from others. Again, it's a lineage. This is, this is stuff that, that people have been doing for, for ages and uh, the fact that you can now help people disseminate that into a wide variety of different, uh, uh, different disciplines, different goals is uh, excellent because I think that there's nothing worse than not living up to your potential. I agree with that. And, and thank you for saying all that. And, and to, to kind of counter what you said, um, I don't think that, that things that are involved in these universal principles are things that people can come up with or create I think that it's just a matter of at some point you will become aware of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like as, as a little kid, you're not aware of, of why there's a thing called gravity, but it's a part of your life every day. You're not yeah. aware of why there's a thing called an atmosphere, but it's giving you life every time you breathe it in. So um, these esoteric metaphysical principles that, that guide everything are much in that way. Um, and we can choose to become aware of them. And because we're going to have to live by them one way or the other, no matter what we consciously think, we are living by those principles. You can argue 
that no, no, the principle of gravity, that's, that's all made up. The earth is flat or whatever, right? But you can also climb up on top of an eight-story building and jump off and the, the sidewalk will teach you the same lesson every single time. Yeah. Right? So you're going to have to live by these principles. And if you're going to have to live by them, um, it makes sense to me to become consciously aware of what they are and consciously aware of how to um, work within the parameters of them in order to experience life best. It's, was it Sir Francis Bacon that said, nature to be commanded must first be obeyed? Yeah. So um, I'm very grateful that my path in understanding how all this stuff works and opening up my mind um, took me through the, the land of the old time strongmen and the, the people that I've made contact with um, through the world of strength, including, including Slim, including you, including Dennis Rogers, you know, there's, there's tons and tons of people that I've met that have been a part of this walk. And I'm very, very grateful that I am able to take some of that, um, put my own, uh, particular flavor on it and help other people utilize principles that, that have nothing to do with what they're trying to do to do what they want to do. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Well, I have to say once again, thank you very much for this uh, most excellent of episodes and for the people who correctly want to follow you on uh, social media and, uh, and the website and get on your email list. What, is the, what are the best ways that they can do that? The best way to follow me on social media would be to look for anything related to Iron Tamer on any of the social media outlets, Twitter, TikTok, uh, Facebook, all of that stuff, um, mm -hmm. Instagram. Uh, any anything related to Iron Tamer will put you in um, in will put me on your radar. Um, I have a private Facebook group for my Superhuman You coaching people. Um, it's just it, it, not like steady clients, but just like people, you know, like like your your Facebook group, right? Yeah. Um, that is Superhuman You coaching. If you're interested in um, reading my book, Superhuman You, that recount some of this this stuff and steps along the way of the journey i give that away for free i just ask that people pay shipping and handling that is at superhumanubook.com superhumanubook.com don't email me and say i went to superhumanu.com and couldn't get your book yeah i know um <clears throat> and then if you're interested in learning more about um you know hear me speak more on the specific mechanics of how I apply this stuff. If you go to superhumanucoaching.com, not superhuman coaching, superhumanucoaching.com, um, there's a presentation there and there's an opportunity for you to answer some questions. And if you um, want to book a call with me to find out if you're uh, a good candidate to work with me on this stuff one on one, we can um, go through that process as well. Excellent. And I'm going to have all that information in the show notes. For those who are interested, I highly recommend it. I have done a couple of uh, workshops with Dave, uh, a couple of training sessions. He's always ahead of the curve. So I can assure you that if you want to be ahead of the curve as well, he is the man to follow. So Dave, thank you once again for coming on the show. Thank you so much for saying that. Thank you for having me on the show. And it's good to talk to you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, folks, as always, have fun and happy training.